Good evening and welcome to another uh, webinar for the Michigan Debate Camp. Uh, my name is Val McIntosh and I am a debate coach at the University of Michigan. Um, we are very excited to be joined by Sydney Pasquinelli, who is the Director of Debate at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Um, she is also a lab leader at the 2020 Michigan Debate Institute. She will be a faculty member in the K-Lab, um, and you will get the opportunity to hear from her a couple of times during the camp um, as well, even if you're not in the K-Lab. And so um, I will turn it over to Dr. Pasquinelli, who is going to talk to you all about um, thinking about the topic from, uh, you know, uh, without, without approaching it from the, from the binary of um, policy versus K arguments. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Valerie and University of Michigan for moderating this webinar and thank you everyone for attending. Again, I'm Dr. Sydney Pasquinelli. Um, you can call me Sydney if you see me at camp. And I'm the director of Wayne State University and a coach for Edgemont High School in the policy and LD divisions. And coming from the perspective of someone who has done both policy and critical debate throughout my career um, in terms of you know, debating, but also coaching, um, I wanted to give a little bit of perspective on approaching the topic outside of the lens of the K policy binary. And so I want to break down a little bit before I start and say, what do I mean by the lens of the K policy binary? And by that, I mean the division of debate into policy args on one side and K args on the other side. And there's some like rationality or rationalization to, to position these two camps as um, ideologically opposed, given that policy debaters often draw from political science, which generally approaches policy from a more pragmatic or practical standpoint. And then we have critical um, debate, which often approaches um, policy through critical theory and critical theory is rooted in the study of policy from usually a more paradigmatic or radical standpoint and so the point of this lecture is not to say that there's no difference between critique and policy or that the differences and approaches should be done away with but the point of this lecture is to, to argue that the binary lens which figures all arguments as being either critique or policy is a lens that is, I'll argue, counterproductive for topic education, um, obfuscates nuanced conversations about policy, um, precludes clash and harms both interpersonal relationships and community building. So in this lecture, before I open it up to a Q&A and discussion, I'll first explain how um, we're all playing the same game. So in other words, I'm gonna deconstruct this binary. Uh, secondly, I'll explore some of the harms associated with the binary. And lastly, I'll give some advice about how to move forward, although I'm looking forward to continuing the last part as we get to camp. Um, all right, so moving forward into section one, deconstructing the K policy binary. So some rhetorical questions to start off. Um, what makes an AF a policy AF? And what makes an AF a critique AF? So the easy answer is a plan makes an AF a policy AF and the lack of a plan makes an AF a KF. But what about the AF that has a plan and a critical framework for defending the plan? So some of you who have enough debate experience to have, it, to have debated you know, these types of AF that have a plan and they also have a more critical framework for defending that topical plan, the easy answer would be, this is a soft left AF. Well, not only is this characterization of topical apps that don't have extinction impacts as soft left, in my opinion, problematic, because it relies on a gendered anatomical metaphor, which establishes 
hard afs as strong and soft afs as weak. But this characterization also invites an overgeneralization that pushes too many apps into the category of soft left and pushes too many proposals and differing theoretical frameworks to defend those proposals into the same category. And moreover, it belies the fact that an app can be topical and critical, which is something that I think a lot of people have unfortunately shied away from. So in the terms of this topic, this uh, criminal justice reform topic, let's use some hypothetical scenarios to demonstrate my point. Because I know that in the initial topic lecture, we talked about how a lot of critical literature will be topical this year. Um, i.e. there's more critical defenses of the resolution. But let's think about different hypothetical 1ACs and how we would characterize them. So my hypothetical scenario one is the 1AC says the police should be abolished. They read cards from Afro-pessimists and post-colonial scholars about how the police are unethical and they argue that the subsequent chaos from the fallout of no police would probably actually be beneficial for accelerating the demise of civil society. So anybody who's debated enough Afro-pessimism rounds, the, some of these buzzwords will sound familiar to you as affirmative or negative arguments. And from my experience, many debaters who, if they were to pull up an app like this on the wiki and say, okay, they, they're saying the police are bad because of Afro-pessimist, like through an Afro-pessimist lens. Many debaters would pull this app up on the wiki and they would gut check to calling this a critique app or a race app and assume that they would have to read framework. But I would call this a topical policy app that has a the critical theoretical foundation i.e. Afro-pessimism could be a critical theoretical foundation that would justify the United States federal government abolishing its police force or even disarming its police force, for example. So in my opinion, gut checking to call this a race app might say more about how you think of the debaters than how you're thinking of the arguments. All right, so hypothetical scenario two is the 1AC says that the death penalty should be abolished. They read cards from both political scientists and scholars about the negative impacts that death penalty has for racial justice and human rights. Um, they read a framing contention, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, well, if you aren't familiar with, we'll talk about it at camp. But they read a framing contention arguing that policymaking or policymakers ought to prioritize structural violence over low probability impacts. From my experience, many debaters would get to calling this a soft left AF. Or maybe a policy AF and their impact of structural violence. Like a policy AF with a framing contention would be another way of generalizing this. But why is this app not critical too? For example, why would you gut to calling app number one a race app, but gut to calling app number two a soft policy app um, when they're both trying to use different methods of politics to solve race or criticizing United States federal government policies for being racist? what makes one of them a soft policy app and one of them a race app. I would argue that it's the binary that causes us to rush to put app number one in that box of K and app number two in that box of soft left. And I would counterinterpret this app as also being a topical policy app with a critical theoretical foundation. So, Here's my hypothetical scenario number three. The 1AC has the United States Supreme Court rule on an area of criminal justice reform, which sets a precedent taking power away from the states. So essentially the United States federal government rules in, you know, 
either one of the three areas to say that now it's not no longer an issue of the states, it's an issue of federal government um, authority. So in this case, the advantage would be federalism and the precedent that this federalism, that this new balance of state and government, uh, federal government power creates and the impacts are extinction level impacts, like maybe the environment or even a nuclear war impact. So from my experience, debaters would gut to call this a policy app. And even though they don't juxtapose and call it a policy like a hard right or a hard left opposed to the soft left F, it's sort of the implication there that the big stick F is hard and the weak soft left F that's aimed towards solving social justice or not um, a big war impact is in a different realm than the policy app that's trying to solve extinction. Like we're playing different games. And also importantly is the assumption that if the team just read the big sick app and the framing sort of stopped at the level of just reading extinction level impacts, that they no longer have a moral framework, that they're just debating about the policy and they don't have a moral framework to justify that policy. But let's break this scenario down further. For those teams that prefer to sometimes read a big stick app, in scenario 3A, so like the big stick team goes into their first prelim round and they're debating a policy team or a team that they perceive to um, only also not read critique arguments. And so the policy team defaults to just reading their AF, not reading a framing contention. Like they just read extinction um, and then there's just an assumption that ex extinction is bad. Well, scenario 3B, like say next prelim round, it's the same big stick AF but they're debating a critique team or a team that's more likely to challenge their paradigm for approaching policy. And so the big stick team or the big stick 1AC is shortened to be a smaller advantage about federalism and then a framing contention about utilitarianism and maximizing uh, how policymakers should maximize utility. Now, what's the difference between scenario 3A and 3B? If there's no framing contention, does that make them like normal policy? But then when they add in a framing contention, now they're soft left or now they're a uh, K team because they have a critical foundational, like a critical justification um, that's founding their theory for their proposition. Well, obviously we don't normally think of the policy team that puts a framing contention in as then all of a sudden being like a merge of a policy and a critical team. We just think of them as a policy team that's defending the status quo. But the status quo in terms of like debate is a normative or like hegemonic ideology about how we should approach policy making, um, but it's still like, it's still, defending the big stick F still requires you to defend that moral framework, even if it's the normative or hegemonic moral framework. So for example, in scenario 3A, if they're hitting a policy team that they just assume is going to accept their framework and so they don't read framing, but then the policy team ends up surprising them and reading critique anyway, then the 2AC is compelled to then justify utilitarianism. Um, and so the addition of the framing contention is proof that the utilitarianism and the theory that policymakers ought to maximize utility, it's not extra topical all of a sudden to talk about that. It was all along the justification and the 1AC strategically didn't put that justification within you know, the 1AC when they're debating a policy team because strategically it doesn't make sense to like insert a part of the debate that's not going to be debated. So if it's a policy, po policy, policy round and you don't read a framing contention, but then the policy team pump fakes you 
and read the critique on the NEG, all of a sudden you you have to defend your utilitarianism framework. So it exposes that that theoretical foundation was implied all along and that it just wasn't the focus of the 1AC because the 1AC was making strategic calculations about what part of the 1AC they thought the other team was going to challenge. So the long way, the long, long TLDR of that is that scenario three, which is that the policy F that we think of as the normal policy F is also just like, you know, hypothetical scenario one and hypothetical scenario two, that this F is also a topical policy F with a critical theoretical foundation. And that's demonstrated by the fact that like it, policymakers have to study utilitarianism as, you know, a theoretical foundation that is juxtaposed to, for example, like deontology or um, universe, like Kantian universal moral ethics or um, decolonial ethics, right? So in, within uh, political science, we still talk about ethics and we still talk about moral frameworks and within critical theory, like academics who do critical theory for a living, we still talk about um, policies and the, the consequences of policies and whether or not policies are justified. So we are all in the business of defending policies or you know, justifying propositions of policies and having theoretical foundations to back those up. And we, we, we have different approaches, but we shouldn't, putting, putting, uh, putting arguments or 1ACs of these different hypothetical scenarios into different boxes obfuscates you know, nuanced conversations. Okay, so now that I've talked about deconstructing the binary, I can talk about the harms that the binary has on the debate community. So first, I think that um, the binary hurts topic education. So the binary hurts topic education because it's essentially a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like if you believe that an AF is not topical, then you're more likely to treat it as not, not topical and not read like the ground that you have against it. Um, also, if from my experience as a judge, when when I see debaters go for framework and substance, they oftentimes gut to going for framework in the 2NR because they don't think they have enough to say on substance, but they do have enough to say on substance to win the debate. And that just shows me that they have a sort of ideological blinder that tells them before the round, I have to go for framework because this app isn't topical, even though they have something to say and they have something to engage with the app. Um, whether that be case turns, a counter critique, um, a counter, you know, a counter plan, some presumption arguments. A lot of times there's enough substance for the negative to win, but they still default to going for framework in my experience. And I, I judge a lot of clash debates. And that also just tells me too that if teams are investing in framework and they have good arguments on substance, if they Dev devoted the entire block to substance, then they would have even more offense against the F. Um, and so I'll get to this later. I'm not saying that I don't think, I think all apps are topical or that I don't think there would be any framework debates in the world that you sort of did away with this ideological um, binary. Uh, but I do think that there would be fewer framework debates and more of an attempt to engage and less hostility and more trust amongst members of the debate community. And that also it harms topic education because for example, scenario one where you have um, 
an affirmative talking about how we should abolish the police through the theoretical framework of Afro-pessimism. If the negative team um, has just framework and says that that shouldn't be allowed in debate because of the there's no place for that moral theoretical perspective on the AF. It like misses the opportunity for you to read a counter plan and say, no, we should reform the police instead, or um, we should, you know, some of the more moderate like reform type um, like TVAs or permutation type suggestions that we see in these debates could be actually deployed as like negative positions and we could have like more nuanced debates about um, how we should approach policy instead of just having the same debate about how we should approach debate. Um, and so that leads to my second harm, which is that the binary seems to obfuscate nuanced conversations about macro and micro policy making. And if we, like we don't agree on method, but if we are right that debate is providing real portable skills to debaters, um, like that is something that people from across the sort of spectrum of ideology agree that debate is providing like portable skills for debaters to take and at least education and also skills to take out of outside of debate then it's disservicing us to intentionally like will ourselves into that prophecy of missing opportunities to talk about how we ought to approach policy making to resolve things like critical or structural impacts because while we might not all agree on method there does seem to be a consensus in the debate community that racism and environmental um, like destruction are impacts that policymakers ought to be um, approaching and we might disagree about whether we should take like macro or micro political measures but if we agree that you know we are debaters are the future debaters are taking these skills and taking them um, outside of debate and that there are real impacts like racism and environmental injustice out there that we're doing a disservice to the debaters and our own community by um, continuing to rehash the same debate about debate instead of like getting into the nitty gritty and nuance of how we should approach um, solving some of these problems or like for the example of this topic solving the problems with our criminal justice system um, but a lot of the advice I'm talking about actually applies more broadly and out, outside of this topic as well. So if all interpretations of framework allow for critiques on the negative, which seems to be another consensus about within the debate community that like even the most conservative versions of framework make the like switch side debate solves or the argument that you can have the critique on the negative, you just can't have it on the affirmative then there seems to also be a consensus that um, the more radical critiques of macro political action are welcome for 21st century political education. Like they're an important part of education of switch side debate solves on the neg. That means we need to be having these debates in order to have education. So why not be open to having some of these conversations on the affirmative and having more, like not no limits on how we talk about the topic, but a more open of a limit than what traditional um, hegemonic interpretations of framework allow for. So let's not be closed off to like the, this type of clash, um, closed off to clashing over, over these issues in our performances. Like if we welcome switch side debate, if we welcome map, like critical theory into our community, then let's be more innovative about how we set like set some limits and so we don't like completely explode limits but also expand the limits a little bit to allow for like more discussion of the things that we seem to have a consensus on like are important to discuss like the critique on the neck um if it's important um, for critical education, topic education in the real world, 
then why not be open to discussing some of it on the affirmative as well. And then um, a footnote on the clash of civilizations, because I've already given, I, I think that the clash of civilizations is an inappropriate metaphor for a few reasons. So I've already explained why I think soft left F is inappropriate, but um, I think the clash of civilizations metaphor is inappropriate. First, it has roots in a racist theory about geopolitics. Second of all, it's rooted in the binary, which posits like critique debaters and policy debaters as different civilizations, which I think like section one in my deconstruction showed how we're in the same civilization, we're doing the same thing, we just have different approaches to methods. And like lastly, clash is king in debate, so why would we be, like why would we look, as, look at a clash of civilizations as a bad thing? Like if anything, a clash of civilizations should be something that is welcome. I mean, maybe not like the exact word clash of civilizations, but like a clash of political worldviews is what we're supposed to be doing. So the idea that a clash of civilizations shows that there's a breakdown in our community is not like computing to me because it more seems like a clash of civilizations and the like the more perspective that we can bring into how we approach policy the better like the more clash the better and obviously the have the switch side debate having the critique on the neg proves that clash is possible in the world of like macro political action versus um micro political resistance you know that's an oversimplification but it is um it's important to have that kind of clash we all agree on that so let's perform that agreement and then um Finally, I think that the binary hurts interpersonal and community relations, and this one might be the most obvious, but obviously putting people into different camps and like making debaters feel like, and this is not your all's fault as debaters as much as it is our fault as the leaders of the community and the judges and like the way that the coaches have figured the pref card i think has to do with this more than like you all but this is a call for debaters to sort of like work on transcending this which i think that you all are already moving that in that direction but i'm just trying to like accelerate that movement that taking debaters and forcing them into the camp of either policy or critique is like damaging psychologically it hurts the community in terms of like makes kids feel bad about themselves for choosing the wrong side like as i've shown it is unnecessary because you shouldn't have to pick a side like debate is a like a an avenue or a safe space like for self-expression and experimentation so you should be able to experiment with different types of apps or different defenses of the resolution and different um, moral theoretical frameworks without being punished or without feeling like um, you have the burden of defending a half of the debate community when you choose what 1AC you want to read at a tournament. So I think that it hurts interpersonal relationships. It makes people feel like when they pick a side, they're picking who their friends are too. And um, I don't think that the choose your side mentality, like competition is good for our community, but the choose your side like mentality and culture and the idea that we are a clash of civilizations is detrimental to the bait community and um, it means that like the pref card is weaponized in a way um, that hurts not only debaters but also hurts judges because judges can sort of also choose their camp and they miss out on the opportunity to learn from students and see how students are um, defending things differently than how they defended things when they were a debater like I've learned a lot I always read a plan when I was when I was a debater in college. Like I never read a critique critical app. Um, I, and when I was a sophomore, I read like an abortion app and it had a framework that was like a feminist framework for defending it. Um, and then I had more big stick like policy apps that were more conservative or more, you know, liberal. Um, but uh, in terms of, I don't know, why I was going off on on that tangent about myself, but uh, basically, um, I think that debaters should be able to um, choose their, you know, choose to experiment within these different 
um, within these different types of arguments and just approach argument as argument. And now I remember I was saying um, my exposure to critique debaters and the types of arguments and other types of defenses of the resolution have opened my eyes to um, different literature bases and different theoretical moral frameworks. And so I have even as a PhD student find myself learning from students who debate in ways that are like different from how I debated. And I know that when I debated, I was debating in ways that were different from how, you know, the people who taught me to debate were debating. So debate is constantly innovating. And I think that weaponizing um, changes in um, argumentation and opening up limits, um, like weaponizing that binary and making people choose sides on the either um, stick with the limits that the sort of hegemonic interpretations of framework allow or have no limit like that that um, that binary is detrimental to debaters and judges from an educational and a psychological standpoint and now I'm definitely ranting so um, my advice and I know I'm kind of no it's only 730 so I have three pieces of advice for moving forward. So now that I've talked about the harms, I'll talk about a couple different strategies for um, approaching things differently. First is just the simple advice of taking off the lens of the binary. So looking for arguments, not labels. Like approach the argument when you see it on the wiki as an argument, not a label. Like when you see it and do the the brief like run through, don't just be like, oh, it's a soft left F or oh, it's a race F or oh, it's a big stick F. Like what argument is it making? What theoretical framework is it defending? I think that the the like the easy merger of LD and policy over the past few years has shown that like policies can be defended from different moral frameworks and you can see like policy and LD borrowing from each other in terms of like what policies do we defend and what moral frameworks do we use to defend those policy choices. Um, so taking off like even looking to the LD community as a um, as a sort of example of taking off um, being able to take off the lens and j justify multiple theoretical frameworks. And then my second piece of advice is innovate framework, like especially in the context of Trump um, and like fascists taking over our government. I'm always kind of surprised how um, non innovative framework it um, has been um, in, in the last few years in terms of like tailoring um, the arguments to um, adapt to like keep up with the pace of adaptation and innovation that critique apps have it's not that framework hasn't been innovated obviously it has but that innovation isn't happening at the same pace as the innovation of affirmatives and different ways to justify them and i think part of it is that binary is like preventing us from innovating and finding new ways to engage with new ways to like be, be affirmative. And so it's like on framework, for example, it's not just an all or nothing, like a game with limits or a game with no limits. It's like, I think that the status quo sort of shows that like the community has been okay with like opening up the limits of, the, of what we talk about um, it, to some extent without like opening them up, opening the flood floodgates completely like we still have topics even though we've had multiple like critical teams win um like national championships and stuff like we still have topics we still have most debates um happen like be initiated about the topic so i think that the idea that um, all debaters are going to quit because there's no limit um when you let critique when you let teams have more flexibility in how they define the resolution that hasn't come to fruition and so instead of being just dishonest about the fact that there's absolutely zero limits um, 
or instead of being like vehement about accepting that there's a very particular set of normative normative limits which is fiatting an app with like a utilitarian pragmatic like saving the most lives calculation is the only way to be topical but what about like models that allow for a diversity of moral frameworks like i was talking about that allow debaters to defend the plan um or you know different interpretation like plans that can be interpreted as topical uh, with a more um open like a less limited conception of the topic how would that expansion of topic ground and its educational value um, compared to the increased research burden on the negative so rather than just keeping on like repeating the same arguments that we heard five, 10 years about how like no ground equals we can't predict it at all equals we can't debate it, have a more nuanced discussion about like how much we should open up the topic and how much educational value that we'll gain by opening up the topic and then how much that, you know, educational value, like how net beneficial it is compared to the actual decrease in research burden, um, given that yes the research burden would increase but no it would not cre increase infinitely in the model that i have so yes it you would admit that you would have to go to new sides of the library um but not every side of the library so um my vision would not eliminate i, I think i said this it wouldn't eliminate t debates or framework debates but it would reduce the number of framework debates and two NRs because obviously there's still going to be teams that are like no we're not top we're not going to defend a top of that or like we're not going to defend we're not going to like talk about the United States federal government at all or um you know we're anti-topical there's always going to be those teams um so it's not that again it's it's not that I'm trying to completely get rid of this distinction it's just that the binary um pushes too many apps in that category of critique and like prevents the engage like engagement from happening where it could happen basically framework should actually be like a backup option rather than like framework should be like a plan b when you don't have like engagement not like framework is your plan a and you go out and just research a topical version of the app because i think that like the proof is in the pudding that that teams will go out and like that a team that they've already debated and they already know how the app is they'll still go out and just research the topical version of the app um rather than like coming up with a substantive strategy because they don't believe that it belongs on the topic so even though they've predicted it they still don't believe it belongs and so it's not just <laughs> an issue of predictability it's an issue of what you believe belongs at that point all right, so um, my third and final tip before I go on to Q&A is innovate your NEG strategies. And this applies for against like the, um, what, you know, what would in, incorrectly be called like a soft left app, but like a topical app that has critical justifications of a variety of sort, like innovate your negative strategies against that. But even against anti-topical or non-topical apps, like I wanna see like, and part of what I'm gonna work on um, while well, I'm at Michigan is innovating negative strategies against critical affirmatives to include disadvantages, case turns, counter plans, picks. Like if you have a disad, you can read a pick against a critical F and um, like there's a good theoretical argument to be had that non-topical Fs have an even higher burden than topical Fs to defend every single part of the 1AC because they weren't even like bound by the resolution. They got to choose all the words in the 1AC. They got, they got to choose everything, their theoretical framework that went in the 1AC. So it's like, read a pick and choose the thing you have a disad against and say, you know, the pick provides uniqueness for your net benefit and just proves that the whole app isn't a, an opportunity cost to, you know, resolving the disad um, or even like, if it's an anti-topical app, instead of just saying there's a TVA, like read the TVA as a counter plan. If they're saying like the TVAs like cannot work, if, if these types of debates where they're saying the TVA is the opposite of the plan because the plan is anti-topical, then 
defend the topic on the net, you know what I mean? And then we can have a real debate about substance instead of just having that same debate about framework. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, taking the lens of the K off and, or the K policy binary, removing that, those, you know, metaphorical glasses will help you increase your clash, decrease your hostility, and maximize the educational and portable skills of debate. And thank you so much for listening. I look forward to joining the Michigan um, camp and specifically the critique lab, but um, like Valerie said, I'm also excited to you know work with all the students at the camp, not just the critique lab. Great, I'm gonna go through and uh, read off a couple questions that we got in the Q&A um, and um, if people have additional questions whether about stuff that Sydney has already talked about about some of her answers to these questions feel free to keep adding stuff to the Q&A. Um, so the first question um, some of these questions are a little bit long so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of give you the the full read of it and then um, so the first one says, uh, understanding that both deontological and utilitarian arguments have an ideological basis. It's my understanding the usefulness of creating those distinctions uh, is twofold. One, that deontological affirmatives seem to defend their ethics in the 1AC because if they did not, the implicit drive to prevent suffering, which is the basis for both teams' eth ethics, would mean that any dissent with a higher magnitude without, would outweigh. Therefore, the neg in classifying an app as deontological understands the affirmative will make probabilistic style arguments against disads and can be prepared for that question being front loaded. Similarly, the negative can understand the affirmative is more likely to contest the form of disadvantage on top of the substantive form of the argument. How, absent the deontological utilitarian and binary, um, how can we make that distinction uh, that you know, we think that people tend to think is vital to those strategic choices and what would be a better way to approach that, um, that, that strategic choice. Okay. All right. So good question. Um, I think I'm understanding it right to say, uh, if we didn't have the binary between deontological and utilitarianism, how would, we, how would we resolve some of these issues of policymaking? But that's my exact point. Like, I'm not talking about the binary between deontology and utilitarianism being good. I'm talking about the binary between thinking of an AF that does deontology as critical and thinking of an AF that does utilitarianism as being policy. That's the binary I'm thinking about. Because what I'm saying is that an app that uses Kant's deontological ethics or you know, a, a secondary source of deontological ethics or an app that does utilitarian justifications as the question sort of pointed out, they're both trying to maximize um, or minimize suffering. So when it, this is a perfect example of a good clash of civilizations because you have the, the necessity of resolving these moral frameworks in order to decide how we should, like which proposal of policy making should um, be prioritized over the other, like affirmative or negative, yes or no to the plan. So it's like, we have to resolve the meta level of deontology on utilitarianism before we can resolve whether or not the plan, or like it's part and parcel of resolving how the plan, whether or not the plan is a good idea and so in that sense, like the moral framework is an intrinsic part of debating. And so m part of my argument is that we normally think of policy apps as not having a moral framework and critique apps as having a moral framework because the critiques have to like forward their moral framework more because they know that it like runs counter to the norm and it's going to be challenged more. Whereas like utilitarianism, often they don't forward their um, their framework, but it's still there in the background. And if it's challenged, they end up having to um, defend it. And so I think that your question definitely shows that like resolving this deontological utilitarianism is important, is like very important for um, deciding whether or not plans are, political plans are a good idea. And that's why we should embrace that clash of, of 
civilizations or competing political moral frameworks. We should embrace that and view it as an intrinsic part of debate instead of viewing it as a, a binary where only critique debaters are doing that moral framework debating. That's great. Um, so the second question is, what tips do you have for reading uh, policy apps with critical justifications? Um, and how would you suggest leveraging the critical justifications of the affirmative um, to beat counter plans in particular? Yeah. So um, I would say, first of all, that defending moral frame, obviously there's models that have had relative success in terms of in LD, the deontological model of, okay, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't make decisions based on how other people are gonna act. We should make decisions based on what's ethical. So it's like, even if, for example, sexual violence is inevitable in the world, that doesn't mean we should commit sexual violence. Like that's not how we should do policy. Like, well, if everyone else is doing it, we should do it too. Like, I know that that's not that popular in policy. It's more popular in LD to say, no, we should have like, a more moralistic approach that says like a principled moralistic approach that says like if something's racist or if something is um unethical we shouldn't do it regardless of the potential consequences so that's like there's a variety of ways to defend it that way then there's like the structural violence ought to be prioritized combined with not only just like big stick like low probability high magnitude shouldn't come first because in debate, I'm sure those of you who've tried and experimented with this, you'll find that it's hard because if you concede a disad, it's no longer like a low probability impact. It's like 100% probability. So it sort of messes with your framing. So like those type of framing arguments combined with critiques of the impact of the disad. So you're not no linking out of the disad and saying like, we don't accept, we won't defend the United States for our government, any consequences. like you're just like you're critiquing the impact and saying that the impact is like a, co a construction of for example um either you know security or um like capitalist interests that there's an incentive for corporations or there's incentive for colonizers um or neo-colonizers to sort of like forward these as impacts to prevent the type of stuff that the affirmative is doing so if you are going to do impact to calculus that sort of like avoid low probability impacts if you're not going to get in the nitty-gritty of like uniqueness and link debate you have to have like an impact turn that challenges the probability of that impact happening. So for example, like terrorist threat construction. If you say like terrorist threats are constructed in order to uphold um, like United States power, like military power globally, and that there's an incentive to sort of over-exaggerate or even encourage terrorist attacks for the sake of that, that project, then you're like calling into question the probability of that impact combined with your argument that like your app is happening now it's the most probable so if you are going to go that route that route of um doing the probability versus magnitude make sure that you have an inroads to proving that their impacts aren't as probable um, another piece of advice that i have is and this could be something you could experiment with and i think that it's not incompatible with also saying like your affirmative is topical of saying like we the debaters are the agents of the resolution because the resolution is resolved colon proposition of the po of policy right so it's like we are resolved me and my partner are resolved colon that the united states federal government should enact a policy so it's like you if you think of yourself yourselves as the debaters as the agents of the resolution then you just have to be resolved that the united states federal government should do something which gives you more flexibility at, at, to like defend your performance of how you presented that proposition and why you presented that proposition so if you had like um you know like a um an afrofuturistic uh, 1AC about a different world in which there were no police, you know, and that was part of your defense of abolishing the police force. And you're saying, well, like, we're the agents of the resolution and we used critical Afro 
futuristic scholarship in order to come to the conclusion that the United States federal government should abolish its police force. So now you're no longer like taking on that burden of role playing as the United States federal government and saying like, we are the United States federal government and we have to defend that the United States federal government is reformable because you could just say like from an Afro-futuristic perspective or from a um, like, you know, queer radical perspective or something that we think the United States federal government should abolish the police force. We don't have to defend everything that the United States federal government has done up until this point. Like part of our suggestion that the United States federal government should abolish its police is because of all the bad stuff you're talking about, you know? So long winded way to say, um, there's a variety of ways to approach being topical and having interpretations that say, hey, we are topical, we are debating about the topic, and we are defending the proposition of the resolution without having to like defend all parts of the United States federal government or even defend that reform is like possible to solve everything. Like there's, um, be more creative and think about ways that if you envision yourself as being the agent of the resolution, how you can justify um, your defense of the proposition that follows the colon. Yeah, so I actually got a follow-up question about that that um, that argument that you were describing, which is, you know, is that how how might people be able to use that argument, the idea that we the debaters are the actors of the, of the resolution in performance uh, style affirmatives? Yeah. So like, for example, if you just accept the traditional model that once I read the United States federal government, I'm defending the United States federal government. But once you say like, if you think of it as more like being resolved that the United States federal government should, you know, reform sentencing or should reform its policing, it's, it then changes the perspective of the debate to be about like, basically you can say your performance is making a demand on the state or your your performance like let's say you say the united states federal government like back to my example of like um queer futurism or yeah let's let's say like queer futurism you say like you have a um an aff that's sort of like a utopian vision of the police like only working to police like social microaggressions or something, you know, like we are in a society where like macro violence and militarism is like so disconnected from reality that the police would really just be there to monitor like, you know, microaggressions or something like, <laughs> I mean, obviously there'd be dissats to that. So good, good um, shows that there's, you know, ground there, but um, you could then say, all right, by envisioning this sort of queer utopia, um, that this is our way as agents of the resolution to like defend um, that the United States, United States federal government shouldn't do this because like this is the world that we should be trying to realize or enact. You know, so that's one example. Um, and that, that seems to be in line with what a lot of teams, you know, want to defend as it relates to the consequences of the AF, the topical consequences of the AF to begin with. I mean, a lot of teams do, you know, will make the argument, will we'll defend a world where something similar to what the AF does happens, and you can read disads based on that. Would you, would you say that that's kind of within that framing that you're describing? Mm-hmm, Yeah. And I think that, you know, if, you, if you're if you affirmative, you do have to recognize that if you're going to defend the topic, like there are going to, you are going to have to answer more things like counter plans and, and disads and stuff like that. But I do think that um, framework debates in this binary of like, you either have to be critique or you have to be policy has cut, like has led to this sort of not enough like offense is being pushed on critical teams right now. Like they aren't being challenged enough. And, you know, in my opinion, it's stifled innovation of critical debate to not be challenged, to not be challenged at the level that policy debaters are being challenged on like disads and counter plans and stuff like that. Um, but remember, like I said, um, like 
it's think about the impact rather than the link. So if you if you are a cr critical debater and you're defending like that the United States federal government should reform its criminal justice system to like let's say um, hypothetical scenario number two where you're talking about um, racial injustices and accidental deaths um, on Latino and black people as a result of the combination of like racism and um, the death penalty being allowed in like state you know state governments being allowed to enact the death penalty um, that instead of trying to like say and try to instead of trying to no link out of everything think about the implications that they're arguing on the opportunity costs of the impact of the disad versus the app so if they're saying like that the impact is the economy then you already have an implicit sort of critique that's like prioritizing the economy over the lives of people of color is problematic and so you don't have to know link in order to get offense against the dissent in a world that you're affirmative and defending the topic. Like you can say, sure, there's a risk that the plan is going to hurt the economy, but we think that ethical policymakers should take that risk and prioritize the lives of people of color, innocent people of color who are being put to death over the economy. Just like, you know, the civil war, we, pri you know, prioritize do you prioritize economy over abolition? Take that risk, like take the risk that the cotton industry, you know, dies for the sake of abolishing slavery. So I think that affirmative teams who take this more, this, this route, it, it does like, I, I guess maybe part of my, my lectures has had sort of seemed like um, address towards policy people like you need to make more of an attempt to meet in the middle but this also applies to like critique debaters of like don't shy away from engaging with the topic and say like actually that's a messed up justification rather than like we can't answer dissets because there's so many of them just think more meta level about the impact level like there's only so many impacts that they can leverage as an opportunity cost and then how can you say leveraging that opportunity cost is unethical under my framework yeah, so I'm gonna, we have time for to do about one last question and I'm gonna kind of give a, a shortened version of this is a very long question, but uh, I mean, I think that the, so this question kind of is basically, you know, the process you're describing of trying to come to as a community, a place where we have a slightly more expansive understanding of what the topic means, um, how do what's the, what is what is a process we could you know come to to do that and um you know how do we try to incorporate different potential versions of what that looks like without kind of people trying to skew it for competitive interests and rather like trying to come up with something that is educational for both sides and gives you know, gives everyone a, an opportunity to engage the topic from a, from a variety of perspectives. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the innovation part is important here, like innovating in labs on your squad um, throughout the season in terms of, you know, it, even innovating from round to round when you hit the same competitors, like taking things to the, to the next level argument wise instead of just saying that's going to be a clash of civilizations debate it's going to happen how it's going to happen let's not research or think about it um so uh, it starts at the level and part of the reason i address the the title this way is to show that like it's a lens it's it's an approach it's an ideology it's the way that you approach the community so if you can think and take a step back and say i should take like the glasses, the lens off and, and approach argument as argument. I do think that um, like approach is the first thing. Second thing is um, like along the lines of innovation, I think that there needs to be an attempt to, for example, like ask a cross X question, will you defend the plan? And if they say yes, like believe them, but obviously there's the strategic thing of like, what if they're lying, you know, which I'm not gonna say there aren't gonna be teams who are like, yeah, we'll defend the plan and then they won't. But like, instead of investing on framework and having that self-fulfilling, like 
I know they're not going to be topical by the end, so I'm just going to make it eight minutes of framework in the 2NC, but then they end up defending it, you know, like have short inversions of like theory or make it like m innovate in terms of theory where it's like, take it at face value that they'll um, like make a moving target theory argument. That's like, if they say we will be topical, you accept it, you read your ground. And then later they're like, never mind, we weren't topical. You can read a new theory violation that's like, you changed what your AF was and you should lose because you're a moving target, not you should lose because of like how the AF was in the first place or how we thought from the very beginning that you were gonna take this AF, right? So it's like have more, and I, I always have thought that in the last like 10 years, there needs to be more of a delineation between like framework as a topicality argument and framework as like a policy making good critique and that a lot of teams are just sort of mashing these two together. But really we have some people who think like policy making is always a better option and they're gonna challenge it from like a substantive position and sort of say like policy making solves better. Or you're gonna have like the T people who say like this just doesn't belong in the deb in debate on the affirmative. Um, if you believe it doesn't belong in debate on the affirmative and they're saying, no, 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 we meet your model, like have some theory blocks like prepped for you know the team that changes the way that they debate their app and then say we should set a precedent that doesn't allow affirmatives to change what their affirmative does throughout the debate or you know one model that i've been trying to push on my policy debaters is like a framework that says you should have to defend a plan and solvency like it doesn't even have to have united states federal government it should just be a plan and you should have to defend like advantages and solvency and then we can challenge that like um and and it gives you stable ground so it's a call for negative teams to be more open to debating affirmatives that aren't that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable but also a call for critical teams that have felt uncomfortable with engaging in the policy to like engage with it and actually think about the way that these two things are interacting with each other the way that their moral framework actually does clash and call and in, call into question some of the truth values behind your moral framework and be willing to like have that clash and so I guess that's a good place to like end it and um, you know to say that this was not like targeted towards any one specifically in debate but this was like a broader call to all sides of the debate community to like not be afraid of clash of civilizations not be afraid of clashing in terms of you know what i would call instead of a clash of civilizations like a clash of re moral frameworks and moral frameworks of how we justify particular policies like don't be afraid of that don't think it's something new it's what people who've been studying and debating about politics in communities even outside of ours have been doing for uh, forever <laughs> um and and yeah don't be afraid of of that clash and and just don't weaponize the binary against each other and i think that it will be like i think that high schoolers have already started doing this and unfortunately college like coaches it seems to me push people into this binary even further and so um part of my my mission is to like put like sort of you know the have the debaters change our perspective through their actions. And so um, I hope that's not putting too much of a burden <laughs> on you, but. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Your insight was incredible. Um, you know, I think we had a really great conversation with some of the great questions we had. Um, thank you again to Dr. Sydney Pasquinelli from Wayne State University for talking with us tonight. Um, we will have another webinar next week with Jasmine Sidham of Harvard Westlake School and Dartmouth College. So uh, keep an eye out on Canvas for an announcement with the link for that webinar. Um, additionally, feel free to um, follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, follow HS Impact, follow at Michigan Debate, um, and you will see tons of new content um, coming up all the time. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in, and thank you again, Sydney. Thank you.